Hello, Dr. Mike here. This is for my Linux class, CIS 2550, and this is a quick little um, video about security. So this is a huge topic. Uh, Linux security, any OS security, really is a whole class upon itself. Uh, there is a lab. We go over a couple of things, and I'll show you a couple of items from the lab um, and point out what, what, why we run those steps, but also I'm going to include some things that are not in the lab document, just some general guidelines, sort of open up your mind to uh, system security. So first off, um, where do you start with system security? So there's some really good stuff out there. Uh, example, CentOS has a OS protection how-to, and this is usually referred to as system hardening uh, in sort of industry terms. And I'm just going to say this at first, of all possible, uh, do this during install. So before you even install a server or create that baseline server, uh, you want to go ahead and you want to build in security from the beginning. It's going to make it much easier than having to go back and redo a server. Uh, so in any case, uh, system hardening, and there's a bunch of stuff here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, just look at the wiki for CentOS and look for OS protection. Uh, it's a fantastic guideline. Many guidelines out there too. Red Hat has their own. Um, Ubuntu, everyone's got some sort of guidelines for system administration and security. So let's start off with some of the stuff in the lab. So the lab's going to talk about um, finding files with special permissions. Uh, these are referred to as uh, the GUID or uh, the GUID bits, uh, G-U-I-D, S-U-I-D. These are special permission bits that allow you to run a script based on the permission of the user that made it. So for example, uh, a root user creates a uh, backup script. So called bu.sh. Uh, this backup script will take your home directory, uh, slash home, whatever it is, and maybe, maybe pops it to a backup, a, uh, a backup directory under its same name. So pretty handy script, you can have it, you can run it as is, but uh, who owns the script? So remember in the terms of Linux, uh, the script is run, you need to run it with root ownership. If I run it, even though it's rw, let's say it's read x for everybody, r dash x, our last uh, set of permissions there, which is for everyone or all others. Uh, maybe also group is Rx. And of course, root has owner. Um, owner has, a, of course, RWS to say. So if I run it as user Mike, uh, it will run under my my ownership. I need to run with the same ownership as root because maybe access to this drive is locked down. There's steps in the, in the script that needs to have root access. So there's a special uh, permission set. Uh, we have uh, GUID and SUID. Also something called sticky bit, which I'm not going to get into here. The lab will show you though, what this means is you're going to just do a search. You can do a find command with perms, dash P-E-R-M. For 4,000, uh, and that's for the uh, SUID, and you can do a GUID search. I think for 2,000, I think it is. So um, you'll see it's in the lab again. It's using the find command. Uh, I won't go to the syntax here or run it, but what you're doing is you're trying to find scripts or files that have these special permissions. And so let's say this this script, for example, maybe it's not needed anymore. Uh, it's out there lurking. Problem is, if anyone can get into the system, they can use this uh, to run under elevator privileges. So uh, this can be exploited in some ways. These permissions can be exploited. So it's important to lock these down or find files that have these special permissions. Uh, and that's what this uh, GUID, SUID search will do. Uh, usually it's, it's referred to in a lot of guidelines to, um, you know, if at all possible, don't use those. Uh, but in any case, uh, Permissions, we'll look at that. So next thing we'll look at, of course, is probably the biggest one is going to be your network. And that will be your ports. So I know the lab's going to have you run um, looking at NetStat. 
So, so uh, netstat dash tln. And what we're doing is we're looking at uh, TCP. We're listing out TCP with the end for port number. So what you want to do is you want to sort of uh, use this as a built-in tool to see what is being exposed. So again, the biggest part really, uh, one of the biggest things of security of your system, again, is going to be your network access. So of course we have, we're talking about our firewalls, um, IP tables, that's a whole other thing. Definitely look at that. There's information on that on your firewall, but also just what is open. Now this can be done with a scan using Nmap, which might not be installed. Nmap is a security tool. I've been in some places where it's referred to as a hacking tool and they don't allow it to be installed at all. Um, if it is allowed to be installed, it's a fantastic tool used to audit all systems in your network. But to bring it down to securing your single system, you do have Netstat, and Netstat is local. So here we can see we have 25 and 631. So these are running, they're all running for local addresses here. Uh, what you wanna do is you wanna see, well, what are these services? So what we wanna do is we wanna connect uh, the port number to a service. And this is going to go into the next next topic here. We'll talk about securing services. Uh, but for now, though, just audit the system. Uh, so what we can do is we can, um, like, there's a file called etsy services. And we can grep for, let's say, 631. And uh, if I do cat, <laughs> there we go. All right, besides the typo there. Uh, 61 is internet printing protocol. So you can see here we have, uh, we can also do the same thing. And we can also, then we can grep this case for 25. So 25 here is our mail service. So definitely want to go ahead and audit your system and see what is being listened to. Now it's because the port's open doesn't mean it's anything behind it, but what we're doing is we're trying to expose this channel here. Uh, what service is listening on what port? And then verify it with the firewall too. So is our firewall open the port or is it blocking that port? And then we're going to talk about another thing we can put into place here in a second called TCP wrappers. But for now, though, we want to see what's open. And NetStat's a fantastic tool for that. The lab will have you run this. Uh, Etsy Services is a great uh, file to see what the service is that's using that port. Uh, so again, we want to build this audit list. So next up is um, probably not in the lab, but it is going to talk about services. Now, we've done labs on services before. So this is a Fedora-based system. So this uses in system, sys, system control, list units. All right, so next up is this. We're gonna take a deeper dive in here and look at this part of it. What services are running? And this is, goes back to basic hardening, um, some basic hardening steps here, which I'm not gonna go into this whole document here. Um, what we want to do is we want to see what is running. And we can do this with uh, in Fedora with system control list units, or if you're on CentOS, uh, we could do is we could do chk config dash dash list. And we can look at our services. And again, that, that, that also works on um, CentOS, but CentOS being a, a NIT based system, it's going to use Again, this um, check config uh, dash dash list, which actually is going to the wayside, so we'll see probably the Fedora based command is probably a little more accurate. We'll probably run into that more, uh, which is the system control. But in any case, uh, there's GUIs for this too, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, what it comes down to is this what's, you know, I'm on run level, let's say it's five. What is set to run and what is set not to run? So, for example, let's pick on cups again. And I'm not going to go into the syntax of service command or system control, other labs that we have in this class for that. But I know when to employ these commands, 
is to see and audit my systems. If I'm not going to be a print server, why run cups? So if I'm not going to, um, you know, this goes into the deep dive, then, then I can close this port. I can close that service. I can also make sure the firewall doesn't allow it. So we built this layer of protection. So the lab will have you use net, the net stat to look at what ports are being open. Use other commands you have available, like um, we have, of course, our system control list units, and see what's active running, uh, what's active to be to be loaded, and what's active. Um, do I need to have Bluetooth running? Uh, if not, uh, you know, deactivate it. You can even go as far as to remove that everything with that service. You can go into, into your app configuration then, um, whether it be um, APT um, or our, your uh, Yum command. But in any case, you, uh, you can go even further and remove these actual services. That way they don't even need to be worried about being patched. There's nothing, there's less patching, less uh, storage. But then let's say print service for again. Let's use our cups, for example. Um, let's say, well, we don't want to remove it. We might need it uh, for one occasion. So you want to deactivate it and make sure there's no external access to it. So again, we have that simple steps here of auditing our services. Um, and we got some commands used for that. So again, there's other labs that go into system CTL and our service command. Phase two systems. So uh, there's some other stuff we can do. Uh, the labs we talk about um, employing your limits command. Uh, Etsy security limits.conf. Um, this is going to show you how you can put limits on users. Uh, this can be good, uh, especially if we have a large user base. Um, you can set limits on what they come and check and run. This way, if a user account get, does get hacked, um, we can at least lock it down to how much it can run. Um, this, is, this is up to, uh, of course, sysadmin and, and your server design, if it makes sense to use this or not. Um, but you'd have the ability to put limits, enforce limits um, on that. So the lab will go over that. Uh, we'll go over the steps. But it's going to deal with that file. Probably the bigger one, though, is, and you probably run into, and in, in the main things, is when dealing with user commands. As of course, passwords. <laughs> so probably the hallmark of most um, or any um, password, uh, any security is, is the username and password. So um, there are some things you can put into play here. Um, passwords themselves. There are some called PAM policies, PAM modules here. Uh, I'm not going to go into all these. This is a pretty deep topic to get into just for a quick thing here about security. Relays though, you can bring this into play and you can set what's called, uh, basically you can enforce strong passwords. So with our system auth, for example, um, we can enforce, uh, there's password here, uh, crack lib, so on. You can do all kinds of stuff here. PAM is a huge thing <laughs> that I want to dive into. Realize that it is available and you can use this uh, to enforce strong passwords. Now, beyond PAM, uh, just passwords themselves, uh, we can definitely employ the use of, um, of course, groups, and we make sure password users are part of certain groups. Um, but also, we can definitely um, use our password aging. So, our ch age. For example. So, ch age. -E, we can see the last time password was changed uh, for this user. Uh, we can see if it's if it ever expired, and number of days between password changes, and so on. So you can modify all these, and we can set, for example, uh, if we wanted to, we can modify it for um, max number of days. And now we can put a max number of days between password changes. So. Again, look at the help, uh, the, the man page or dash dash help for CHH. The labs can have you walk through this. In fact, this is part of the lab itself. Um, also, the CHH, you can go through all your users 
um, loop throw users, which are going to be in Etsy password directory. So Etsy password, this is a unique directory here. So I'll talk about this in a second. But again, you can go through and get each username. You can probably see you build a script here for this. I can grab each username out of Etsy password, loop through, do a chh-l, and I can go ahead and parse out information about that user. Um, build a little script, maybe put it into a database. Um, so you can do homegrown. I'm sure there's there's commercial or even open source um, ways you can do this. Um, any approach works is fine. Commercial, open source, build you know, roll your own script. Uh, but look for you know, make sure things are set. So if you see anything that has uh, maximum days of 999, you can throw a flag up and say, well, I have a user account that's not set for the 30 or 60, 60 days, whatever my policy is uh, for maximum days of password changes. So CHH is a great, great utility for that. Again, the, the uh, script will have you go over that. Um, Etsy password. I know it's PA, it says WD, not password. Um, but this is where user passwords used to be held. So um, we'll go over some background on this. So first off, we have a couple of things here that we can also employ some, some good security things here. And I'll show you, you can actually see it here. So first off, we have like the username, sysadmin. We have their user ID, their group ID, uh, the, the main group they belong in, uh, their home directory, and their default shell. Now the X here denotes that this is this is using Etsy Shadow. Actually, let's just do this. Um, ls l on Etsy password. Now, the thing about Etsy password is it needs to be world readable. Uh, there's a lot of system reasons why for this. I won't go into, it, but it's always been that way, and it's sort of stuck there. Um, now, it used to be Etsy password. Where this X was at would be a hash. A encrypted hash, and this might not the right word, encrypted string, usually a hash in some form of the user password. Now, the problem is I can go through and read everybody's hashes and you can crack them. So, definitely not secure. So, what they did was they removed all the passwords to SE Shadow, which you can see is completely locked down. No one can read it. Uh, now, it's root, of course. Um, I can read it. So this is where you can see, let's go in, here's this admin. Here's their password served from this line here. Again, it's right about there. That's, that's the encryption string for the, that, that password. So those have been moved out of there. So this FYI, you can see it's locked down. Now let's go back and look at SC password. And I'll show you another cool trick you can do. So we have a lot of accounts here that have to deal with not users, but sort of systems. For example, mail, uh, the mail user, um, or we can use MySQL user and so on. So let's go back and look at the mail user. So mail is for is going to be used for the mail service. This goes back again to the auditing your services. Um, a lot of service, services have their own accounts which is good. Um, if the mail service is ever breached, it only can run as user mail. Now, uh, for example, FTP, this is a good one. So FTP service itself, um, if the FTP is ever breached, or if someone gets the FTP username password combination, let's say it's a weak password, they try to log in remotely using a, maybe a default shell, a telnet, hopefully that's not running at all. Um, let's say SSH being our default shell. Um, they have a SBIN no login default shell. So again, we can see a uh, root user has bin bash, but SBIN no login. Now, if you give a user account that login, it immediately gets booted out. Again, this means this is the login shell. So if I try logging in for an SSH, I get logged out. So this is a nice security uh, feature you should audit for. If you ever install any third party apps, um, open source apps, and they need a, are they set up a user account, uh, and it's not SBIN no login, maybe it's, like example, MySQL has been bash, it's probably needed for a reason, but you just want to validate that. You can always go and change it and test it out, maybe not on a test server, but you can always look for this change here. Um, and look how locked, is it possible to lock down that user account? So Etsy password there, 
a couple things about Etsy Password that you want to know about. All right, so I would mention Pam briefly, services. Uh, let's talk about sudo. So this is something that is going to be, um, let's see, sudoers. So first off, uh, Etsy sudoers. Uh, right away, you'll notice this file must be edited with something called VI sudo. There's actually a special sort of version of VI that edits this command or script that uses this command. Um, it's going to validate this file is sort of, it's going to do some extra steps to validate this file is, and it has good integrity. There's no, um, uh, inc there's no misspelling or there's no uh, syntax issues with this file. Uh, so you have to use VI, don't VI Etsy sudo, or use VI sudo. Now, do you use it at all? Uh, this is going to be one of those things where it goes back to the, your sort of a policy about server, your system designer policy. Um, if I have a lot of users, or maybe I have a few users I want to trust with certain commands, I can uh, give them a sudo access. Um, and there's a lot of examples in here. You can definitely look at these examples. Um, I can give I can alias admins, so I can add, you know, have ad, create an alias group called admins. In there, I have these two users, and then I can go in and give admins specific. Um, all right, it's annoying here. Let's see, we're not working. Um, I can give admins, like example, admins have um, maybe services access to all services. And services itself can run these commands, sbin service or sbin check config. Um, I can create my own if I want. Uh, let's say I have a couple of uh, special commands I want to use. I can then add, um, you know, user Mike to services. And then I'll use user Mike to sudo, um, you know, check config, whatever the command is. And of course, it will prompt that user for their password. Uh, you've seen this with sudo before in this class, so take some administration overhead. You gotta have to need some admin overhead for this. If you have a lot of users coming and add and going, it's gonna be more sort of use admin use. But is there to use um, vi sudo sudo vi sudoers? But it's the Etsy sudoers file. Vi sudo is the command to actually add this file. Uh, I believe the lab might have you actually look at this, so I won't go any more into that. But it is something you can use in your security, right? Um, we have our services, we have our users themselves. So we saw Etsy password, um, our users. We saw Etsy password. We can lock down uh, user accounts. They don't have them. We have PAM modules um, to enforce um, strong password policies. So that's definitely parts we're gonna look at. And the lab will talk about this too. So a few things the lab's going to go over here. Um, I will continue on though. Let's see if we're going to need more lab items here. So let's talk about services again real quick. Um, we'll look at Etsy um, TCP wrappers, which probably not be installed in here. Anyways, we'll come back and look at that. <laughs> it might not even be installed. A um, couple things you can do here, of course. Uh, firewalls, IP tables. Um, probably those commons IP tables. Uh, pretty straightforward. There's a lot there to look at. Open and close firewalls. That should be part of your auditing. Uh, make sure your firewalls, you know, your firewall rules are set and staying. Um, and we have something we can do in place here. So let's go back to our services. There's something called uh, TCP wrappers. Great name. And we can sort of wrap these services. So let's see if there's an example here about this. Okay, uh, TCP wrappers. So we have these uh, host.allow host.deny. And so what this means is, I was looking at the wrong file. Um, Host.allow allow 
We have host.allow. We have one called host.deny. So a couple things you gotta do here, and this is comments in these files, you gotta make sure that um, look at the man page for host access and make sure that the service is TCP wrapped. Um, you can see there's a way to do that with LDD um, bin SSH. Let's look at SSH. And we can look for libwrap.so. Let's just scrub for it. Um, let me see, Linux is wrapped there. No, grab for libwrap. Okay, it's not there. So there's a libwrap. Uh, there's a few steps you need to do. I don't want to get into all these here. You want to make sure the service itself has been compiled to use something called libwrap. Um, if it has it, it won't work. Um, let's look at SSHD, for example. That's probably been libwrapped. So which SSHD? Okay, so it's under SBIN. So let's do the same thing. Um, it's under SBIN. There we go, that's been wrapped, okay. So SSH is our SSH service. This is our service that runs for SSH access. Now SSH, SSH is the uh, so client end. So how do we use this? So first off we check to make sure it's been lib wrapped. This is a, probably an upcoming assignment. <laughs> this is uh, doing it with libraries. But LDD is a file you can see what libraries have been compiled with what app. So grip for lib wrap, make sure it's there. So it is, good. Now I can add this. Um, so in, in, into my Etsy host dot allow host dot deny, and then what we can do is um, you can actually this is sshd all for example. You can basically say get allow everyone in, but I can actually can change this string. Uh, there's more examples here. Let's just take this for example sshd all um, and host dot now this this sshd colon, um, here it shows all, uppercase, syntax is important, and there's national spaces there between the colon. Um, that's going to allow all access to the SSHD service from anyone that can come in. In this case, and of course, port's open, port 22 is open, and our firewall uh, is running. So that service is running, it's supposed to be running. We allow access. We can replace this all with more guided or uh, some more restrictions. So let's say we're going to put an internal IP address only. Let's say we have a 192.168.10.1. Uh, uh, so we can actually replace that. And we can do that. We can do the slash 24. We can prepend it with our uh, net map for that, our net mask. And what we can do is this is going to restrict incoming traffic to port 22 from only a certain internal IP address range or external, but um, maybe this is a you know, uh, server out in our um, DMZ. So we can go and restrict that access to SSH. And uh, that's going to harden that with TCP wrappers. So that's an example of TCP wrappers. Um, another thing we can do too is this. Um, SSHD, SSHD config. So we can actually go in, and then this is an example on SSH. Do this for all services. Look at the configuration for all services that you are going to run. So beyond doing um, wrapping, TCP wrapping, we can also go in here and do some things, and this is really good for SSH, is we can say, permit root login, yes, you can switch that to no, which I think is done by default. So what we do is we don't actually allow a root login to SSH. So to go further, we take SSH. Let's say we uh, it's open, it's running, it's patched correctly, but also we uh, use TCP wrappers 
to do that. Now we do uh, we do have good good strong user uh, password policies in place, but we don't want to allow root user access to SSH. So we turn that off. And this is very common, by the way. Um, the means is someone logs into SSH, they have to use a regular username and password, which is probably going to be hopefully stronger based on this. And then we give them sudo. Um, so we ask you sudo commands for that user to run only certain commands to do certain sysadmin functions. Um, or we give them sudo su. Um, or we just allow it just straight on super user su dash. Um, but we have a really strong password for root, a very strong password for root. So we allow either su or sudo. So you sort of build this again layer of security in. Uh, so again, kind of a little longer than that one I like. Last few things here are real important. Um, things to consider uh, is, of course, good old var logs. Um, var logs. Uh, your var log directory, let's just do a shell on it. Var log is going to be, var log messages should be your first stop. You should have some sort of audit in place. You should have log rotations. Um, external logging if it's real high security, which means um, our logs are cut locally under var log, but also with our syslog d, we can also cut to an external log server. Uh, this is to help um, keep some sort of trace of that log in case you need it for forensics work uh, to see what happens if someone wipes the logs out. But your logs should be when you first stop for doing um, any kind of auditing of your system. Uh, last few things here. Uh, there are things you can do to also. Um, beef up TC wrappers, IP tables. Um, there is something called tripwire. Um, let's see. They have tripwire listed here. Don't think they do. Um, tripwire itself um, it's open source and it's also a uh, um, let's look for it here. Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, tamper resistant. So, Tripwire is two things. That's one example. Tripwire, it, it is a open source. There's open source version, there's also a commercial version. Uh, what it does is it goes through and really creates a whole database of high integrity, high or critical system files. So, example, Etsy password we looked at for we looked at a while ago, right? Um, Etsy password. And this file is changed. Um, it sort of creates a database of hashes. It rehashes every so often, maybe daily, and of course you can set this. Uh, this file is changed for any reason. Someone adds a user account, of course the hash will change because the files are modified. It will set off an alarm, hence Tripwire. Uh, Tripwire is a pretty big system to set up, but it is very good for security. Um, again, it adds this, this is called um, sort of tamper resistance. So you can look more about for Tripwire. Um, and last thing, um, even further deeper for security, is something called SE Linux. Um, this SE Linux itself loads with the kernel and it comes default with all Linux. Um, you can load it and it can set another uh, deeper level of authentication, authenticated access. Um, this is using something in cybersecurity called a sort of a, it's almost like a need to know access, but it's something called mandatory access controls. And we'll give you a quick run out of that. So you have DAC and MAC. So DAC and MAC, mandatory access controls. So to keep this real simple, I'll give you an example. Discretionary access controls, which means I'm user Mike. Everything I have in my account in my user home is owned by me. If I run a script, if I run something, it runs as my ID, right? My user ID. So say I run Firefox. 
So Firefox is going to run as user ID Mike. In my home directory, I have all my files, right? And in there I have .ssh files, uh, which is a hidden directory. In there I have my public and private keys, and, I mean, and also I have other sensitive files in my home directory. So under discretion access controls, Firefox has the same access to all my system as I would if I was logged in as a regular user. Let's just pick on SSH for a while. And I have my private key here. Um, my private key, which is definitely something I want to keep hidden. Um, so let's say I load a add-on. I'm going to call add-ons in Firefox. Um, I'll call them add-ons. <laughs> extension add-on. And then unbeknownst, to me, unbeknownst to me, this extension is malicious. Maybe it's a reader extension or add-on. It's very handy, but I didn't know it was has bad code. Well, this is going to try to read all my files in my system and then send them out to a third party. So under regular discussion access controls, this would work because uh, this runs under user ID Mike. It has access to anything Mike would have access to. Under um, SE Linux, we sort of hang tags on stuff, and we add rules to that. So with SE Linux, let's take the same setup here. Um, we add an SE Linux. What it's going to do is it's going to hang a hang a tag on here, and let's say an SSH D tag. So it was SSH and SSH itself, right? Those are the two services: the client service and the daemon service. So this these two tags are hanging on this, this main directory and everything underneath it, of course, is inherits those tags based on SE Linux, there's an inheritance. So let's go back to the Firefox example. Uh, I run Firefox, I put this, uh, this sort of exploitable, I didn't realize this bad extension. When it tries to read this, it's gonna say, it gives it a call domain. It says, well, Firefox is running on the domain of Firefox. And my rule says the only domain that can read these tags is the domain of SSH or SSHD. So we need to know. It's going to check that condition. If it doesn't meet it, it's going to block it. In this case, it would, right? Firefox is not part of this domain of SSH or SSHD. Only those services are, and it will block it. So that is really the probably two minute <laughs> roll up there on SE Linux. Um, and it, it goes with those rules, their science for this. You can look at Red Hat's got a real great write-up on SE Linux. Look at the SE Linux administrator's guide. Um, this is definitely a lot deeper security, but this is under using something called system hardening. This is definitely the rules for that. Um, there's a lot here for that. So again, we'll leave it at that. Uh, but it's something that goes along with temper resistance and system hard, hard, um, hardening. Um, other stuff and, and stuff you'll find here, of course, is um, uh, restricted root access. We talked about it already. And you can restrict who can um, password policies and so on. So this is yeah, a quick rundown of system hardening in Linux. Uh, I know this uh, this week's lab itself um, is going to be only going to cover a few things. Sudo, uh, look at user memory usage. Discover operating ports and modifying passwords. These are definitely some really good introduction to um, system security with Linux. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll end this off with what I started with. Uh, you want to build in this stuff at the beginning. You want to bake in security during design. You design your system and build a sort of a baseline that you can sort of make copies of. And then uh, that way you can audit it, audit it, and you know you're strong with the secure system. So that's it for uh, a little, not little. Okay, I'm at 39 minutes now. We'll end up here. That should end our security discussion and some examples. And I hope it was helpful. Thank you.